James Ewell Brown, Jeb Stewart, February 6, 1833 to May 12, 1864, was a United States Army officer from the U.S. state of Virginia, who later became a Confederate States Army general during the American Civil War. He was known to his friends as Jeb, from the initials of his given names. Stewart was a cavalry commander known for his mastery of reconnaissance and the use of cavalry in support of offensive operations. While he cultivated a cavalier image red-lined gray cape, yellow sash, hat cocked to the side with an ostrich plume, red flower in his lapel, often sporting cologne, his serious work made him the trusted eyes and ears of Robert E. Lee's army and inspired Southern morale. Stewart graduated from West Point in 1854, and served in Texas and Kansas with the U.S. Army. He was a veteran of the frontier conflicts with Native Americans and the violence of Bleeding Kansas, and he participated in the capture of John Brown at Harper's Ferry. He resigned, when his home state of Virginia seceded, to serve in the Confederate Army, first under Stonewall Jackson in the Shenandoah Valley, but then in increasingly important cavalry commands of the Army of Northern Virginia, playing a role in all of that army's campaigns until his death. He established a reputation as an audacious cavalry commander and on two occasions during the Peninsula Campaign and the Maryland Campaign circumnavigated the Union Army of the Potomac, bringing fame to himself and embarrassment to the North. At the Battle of Chancellorsville, he distinguished himself as a temporary commander of the wounded Stonewall Jackson's Infantry Corps. Arguably Stuart's most famous campaign, Gettysburg, was marred when he was surprised by a Union cavalry attack at the Battle of Brandy Station and by his separation from Lee's army for an extended period, leaving Lee unaware of Union troop movements and contributing to the Confederate defeat at the Battle of Gettysburg. Stuart received significant criticism from the Southern press as well as the postbellum proponents of the Lost Cause movement, but historians have failed to agree on whether Stuart's exploit was entirely the fault of his judgment or simply a result of bad luck and Lee's less than explicit orders. During the 1864 Overland Campaign, Union Maj. Gen. Philip Sheridan's cavalry launched an offensive to defeat Stuart, who was mortally wounded at the Battle of Yellow Tavern. Stuart's widow wore black for the rest of her life in remembrance of her deceased husband. <inaudible> Early life Stuart was born at Laurel Hill Farm, a plantation in Patrick County, Virginia, near the border with North Carolina. He was of Scottish-American and Scots-Irish background. He was the eighth of eleven children and the youngest of the five sons to survive past early age. His great-grandfather, Major Alexander Stewart, commanded a regiment at the Battle of Guilford Court House during the American Revolutionary War. His father, Archibald Stewart, was a War of 1812 veteran, slaveholder, attorney, and Democratic politician who represented Patrick County in both houses of the Virginia General Assembly, and also served one term in the United States House of Representatives. Archibald was a cousin of Alexander Hugh Holmes Stewart. Elizabeth Letcher Pandell Stewart, Jeb's mother, who was known as a strict religious woman with a good sense for business, ran the family farm. Education <inaudible> 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 Stewart was educated at home by his mother and tutors until the age of 12, when he left Laurel Hill to be educated by various teachers in Withville, Virginia, and at the home of his Aunt Anne Archibald's sister and her husband Judge James Ewell Brown Stewart's namesake at Danville. He entered Emory and Henry College when he was 15, and attended from 1848 to 1850. During the summer of 1848, Stewart attempted to enlist in the U.S. Army, but was rejected as underaged. He obtained an appointment in 1850 to the United States Military Academy at West Point, New York, from Representative Thomas Hamlet Averett, the man who had defeated his father in the 1848 election. Stewart was a popular student and was happy at the academy. Although not handsome in his teen years, his classmates called him by the nickname, Beauty, which they described as his personal comeliness in inverse ratio to the term employed. He possessed a chin so short and retiring as positively to disfigure his otherwise fine countenance." He quickly grew a beard after graduation and a fellow officer remarked that he was the only man he ever saw that a beard improved. Robert E. Lee was appointed superintendent of the academy in 1852, and Stewart became a friend of the Lee family, seeing them socially on frequent occasions. Lee's nephew, Fitzhugh Lee, also arrived at the academy in 1852. 
In Stuart's final year, in addition to achieving the cadet rank of second captain of the Corps, he was one of eight cadets designated as honorary cavalry officers for his skills in horsemanship. Stuart graduated 13th in his class of 46 in 1854. He ranked 10th in his class in cavalry tactics. Although he enjoyed the civil engineering curriculum at the academy and did well in mathematics, his poor drawing skills hampered his engineering studies, and he finished 29th in that discipline. A Stuart family tradition says he deliberately degraded his academic performance in his final year to avoid service in the elite, but dull, Corps of Engineers. United States Army Stuart was commissioned a brevet second lieutenant and assigned to the U.S. Regiment of Mounted Riflemen in Texas. After an arduous journey, he reached Fort Davis on January 28, 1855, and was a leader for three months on scouting missions over the San Antonio to El Paso Road. He was soon transferred to the newly formed 1st Cavalry Regiment 1855 at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas Territory, where he became regimental quartermaster and commissary officer under the command of Col. Edwin V. Sumner. He was promoted to 1st Lieutenant in 1855. Also in 1855, Stuart met Flora Cook, the daughter of the commander of the 2nd U.S. Dragoon Regiment, Lt. Col. Philip St. George Cook. Burke Davis described Flora as an accomplished horsewoman, and though not pretty, an effective charmer, to whom Stuart succumbed with hardly a struggle, they became engaged in September, less than two months after meeting. Stuart humorously wrote of his rapid courtship in Latin, Veni, Vidi, Victa Sum, I came, I saw, I was conquered. Although a gala wedding was planned for Fort Riley, Kansas, the death of Stuart's father on September 20 caused a change of plans and the marriage on November 14 was small and limited to family witnesses. The couple owned two slaves until 1859, one inherited from his father's estate, the other purchased. Stuart's leadership capabilities were soon recognized. He was a veteran of the frontier conflicts with Native Americans and the antebellum violence of bleeding Kansas. He was wounded on July 29, 1857, while fighting at Solomon River, Kansas, against the Cheyenne. Colonel Sumner ordered a charge with drawn sabers against a wave of Indian arrows. Scattering the warriors, Stuart and three other lieutenants chased one down, whom Stuart wounded in the thigh with his pistol. The Cheyenne turned and fired at Stuart with an old-fashioned pistol, striking him in the chest with a bullet, which did little more damage than to pierce the skin. Stuart returned in September to Fort Leavenworth and was reunited with his wife. Their first child, a girl, had been born in 1856 but died the same day. On November 14, 1857, Flora gave birth to another daughter, whom the parents named Flora after her mother. The family relocated in early 1858 to Fort Riley, where they remained for three years. In 1859, Stuart developed a new piece of cavalry equipment, for which he received patent number 25684 on October 4, a saber hook, or an improved method of attaching sabers to belts. The U.S. government paid Stuart $5,000 for a right to use license, and Stuart contracted with Knorr, Nice, and Co. of Philadelphia to manufacture his hook. While in Washington, D.C., to discuss government contracts, and in conjunction with his application for an appointment into the quartermaster department, Stewart heard about John Brown's raid on the U.S. arsenal at Harper's Ferry. Stewart volunteered to be aide-de-camp to call Robert E. Lee and accompanied Lee with a company of U.S. Marines from the Marine Barracks, 8th and I, Washington, D.C., and four companies of Maryland militia. While delivering Lee's written surrender ultimatum to the leader of the group, who had been calling himself Isaac Smith, Stuart recognized Old Osawatomi Brown from his days in Kansas. Stuart was promoted to captain on April 22, 1861, but resigned from the U.S. Army on May 3, 1861, to join the Confederate States Army. Following the secession of Virginia, his letter of resignation, sent from Cairo, Illinois, was accepted by the War Department on May 14, upon learning that his father in law, Col. Cook would remain in the U.S. Army during the coming war, Stuart wrote to his brother-in-law future Confederate Brig. Gen. John Rogers Cook. He will regret it but once, and that will be continuously. On June 26, 1860, Flora gave birth to a son, Philip St. George Cook Stuart, but his father changed the name to James Ewell Brown Stuart Jr. Jimmy. In late 1861 out of disgust with his father-in-law. Confederate Army <inaudible> 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 
Topic: <laughs> Early service. Stewart was commissioned as a lieutenant colonel of Virginia Infantry in the Confederate Army on May 10, 1861. Maj. Gen. Robert E. Lee, now commanding the Armed Forces of Virginia, ordered him to report to Colonel Thomas J. Jackson at Harper's Ferry. Jackson chose to ignore Stewart's infantry designation and assigned him on July 4 to command all the cavalry companies of the Army of the Shenandoah, organized as the 1st Virginia Cavalry Regiment. He was promoted to colonel on July 16. After early service in the Shenandoah Valley, Stuart led his regiment in the First Battle of Bull Run, and participated in the pursuit of the retreating Federals. He then commanded the Army's outposts along the upper Potomac River until given command of the Cavalry Brigade for the Army then known as the Army of the Potomac later named the Army of Northern Virginia. He was promoted to Brigadier General on September 24, 1861. Topic. Peninsula In 1862, the Union Army of the Potomac began its Peninsula Campaign against Richmond, Virginia, and Stuart's Cavalry Brigade assisted Gen. Joseph E. Johnston's army as it withdrew up the Virginia Peninsula in the face of superior numbers. Stuart fought at the Battle of Williamsburg, but in general the terrain and weather on the peninsula did not lend themselves to cavalry operations. However, when Gen. Robert E. Lee became commander of the Army of Northern Virginia, he requested that Stuart perform reconnaissance to determine whether the right flank of the Union Army was vulnerable. Stuart set out with 1,200 troopers on the morning of June 12 and, having determined that the flank was indeed vulnerable, took his men on a complete circumnavigation of the Union Army, returning after 150 miles on July 15 with 165 captured Union soldiers, 260 horses and mules, and various quartermaster and ordnance supplies. His men met no serious opposition from the more decentralized Union cavalry, coincidentally commanded by his father-in-law, Col. Cook. The maneuver was a public relations sensation and Stuart was greeted with flower petals thrown in his path at Richmond. He had become as famous as Stonewall Jackson in the eyes of the Confederacy. <laughs> Northern Virginia Early in the Northern Virginia Campaign, Stuart was promoted to Major General on July 25, 1862, and his command was upgraded to the Cavalry Division. He was nearly captured and lost his signature plumed hat and cloak to pursuing Federals during a raid in August, but in a retaliatory raid at Catlett's Station the following day, managed to overrun Union Army Commander Maj. General John Pope's headquarters, and not only captured Pope's full uniform, but also intercepted orders that provided Lee with valuable intelligence concerning reinforcements for Pope's army. At the Second Battle of Bull Run, Second Manassas, Stuart's cavalry followed the massive assault by Longstreet's infantry against Pope's army, protecting its flank with artillery batteries. Stuart ordered Brig. General Beverly Robertson's brigade to pursue the Federals and in a sharp fight against Brig. General John Buford's brigade, Col. Thomas T. Munford's 2nd Virginia Cavalry was overwhelmed until Stuart sent in two more regiments as reinforcements. Buford's men, many of whom were new to combat, retreated across Lewis Ford and Stuart's troopers captured over 300 of them. Stuart's men harassed the retreating Union columns until the campaign ended at the Battle of Chantilly. Maryland. During the Maryland Campaign of September 1862, Stuart's cavalry screened the Army's movement north. He bears some responsibility for Robert E. Lee's lack of knowledge of the position and celerity of the pursuing Army of the Potomac under George B. McClellan. For a five-day period, Stuart rested his men and entertained local civilians at a gala ball at Urbana, Maryland. His reports make no reference to intelligence gathering by his scouts or patrols. As the Union Army drew near to Lee's divided army, Stuart's men skirmished at various points on the approach to Frederick and Stuart was not able to keep his brigades concentrated enough to resist the oncoming tide. He misjudged the Union routes of advance, ignorant of the Union force threatening Turner's Gap, and required assistance from the infantry of Maj. Gen. D. H. Hill to defend the South Mountain Passes in the Battle of South Mountain. His horse artillery bombarded the flank of the Union Army as it opened its attack in the Battle of Antietam. 
By mid-afternoon, Stonewall Jackson ordered Stuart to command a turning movement with his cavalry against the Union right flank and rear, which if successful would be followed up by an infantry attack from the West Woods. Stuart began probing the Union lines with more artillery barrages, which were answered with murderous counterbattery fire and the cavalry movement intended by Jackson was never launched. Three weeks after Lee's army had withdrawn back to Virginia, on October 10–12, 1862, Stuart performed another of his audacious circumnavigations of the Army of the Potomac, his Chambersburg raid—126 miles in under 60 hours, from Darksville, West Virginia to as far north as Mercersburg, Pennsylvania and Chambersburg and around to the east through Emmitsburg, Maryland and south through Hyattstown, Maryland and White's Ford to Leesburg, Virginia once again embarrassing his Union opponents and seizing horses and supplies, but at the expense of exhausted men and animals, without gaining much military advantage. Jubal Early referred to it as, "...the greatest horse-stealing expedition," that only, "...annoyed," the enemy. Stuart gave his friend Jackson a fine, new officer's tunic, trimmed with gold lace, commissioned from a Richmond tailor, which he thought would give Jackson more of the appearance of a proper general, something to which Jackson was notoriously indifferent. McClellan pushed his army slowly south, urged by President Lincoln to pursue Lee, crossing the Potomac starting on October 26. As Lee began moving to counter this, Stuart screened Longstreet's corps and skirmished numerous times in early November against Union cavalry and infantry around Mountville, Aldi, and Upperville. On November 6, Stuart received sad news by telegram that his daughter Flora had died just before her fifth birthday of typhoid fever on November 3. Topic Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville In the December 1862 Battle of Fredericksburg, Stuart and his cavalry, most notably his horse artillery under Major John Pelham, protected Stonewall Jackson's flank at Hamilton's Crossing. General Lee commended his cavalry, which effectually guarded our right, annoying the enemy and embarrassing his movements by hanging on his flank, and attacking when the opportunity occurred. Stuart reported to Flora the next day that he had been shot through his fur collar but was unhurt. After Christmas, Lee ordered Stuart to conduct a raid north of the Rappahannock River to penetrate the enemy's rear, ascertain if possible his position and movements, and inflict upon him such damage as circumstances will permit. With 1,800 troopers and a horse artillery battery assigned to the operation, Stuart's raid reached as far north as four miles south of Fairfax Courthouse, seizing 250 prisoners, horses, mules, and supplies. Tapping telegraph lines, his signalmen intercepted messages between Union commanders and Stuart sent a personal telegram to Union Quartermaster General Montgomery C. Meigs. General Meigs will in the future please furnish better mules, those you have furnished recently are very inferior. On March 17, 1863, Stuart's cavalry clashed with a Union raiding party at Kelly's Ford. The minor victory was marred by the death of Major Pelham, which caused Stuart profound grief, as he thought of him as close as a younger brother. He wrote to a Confederate congressman, the noble, the chivalric, the gallant Pelham is no more. Let the tears of agony we have shed, and the gloom of mourning throughout my command bear witness. Flora was pregnant at the time and Stuart told her that if it were a boy, he wanted him to be named John Pelham Stuart. Virginia Pelham Stuart was born October 9, at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Stuart accompanied Stonewall Jackson on his famous flanking march of May 2, 1863, and started to pursue the retreating soldiers of the Union 11th Corps when he received word that both Jackson and his senior division commander, Maj. Gen. A. P. Hill, had been wounded. Hill, bypassing the next most senior infantry general in the Corps, Brig. General Robert E. Rhodes, sent a message ordering Stuart to take command of the 2nd Corps. Although the delays associated with this change of command effectively ended the flanking attack the night of May 2, Stuart performed credibly as an infantry corps commander the following day, launching a strong and well-coordinated attack against the Union right flank at Chancellorsville. When Union troops abandoned Hazel Grove, Stuart had the presence of mind to quickly occupy it and bombard the Union positions with artillery. Stuart relinquished his infantry command on May 6 when Hill returned to duty. Stephen W. Sears wrote, It is hard to see how Jeb Stuart, in a new command, a cavalryman commanding infantry and artillery for the first time, could have done a better job. The astute Porter Alexander believed all credit was due, altogether, I do not think there was a more brilliant thing done in the war than Stuart's extricating that command from the extremely critical position in which he found it. 
Stonewall Jackson died on May 10 and Stewart was once again devastated by the loss of a close friend, telling his staff that the death was a national calamity. Jackson's wife, Mary Anna, wrote to Stewart on August 1, thanking him for a note of sympathy. I need not assure you of which you already know, that your friendship and admiration were cordially reciprocated by him. I have frequently heard him speak of General Stewart as one of his warm personal friends, and also express admiration for your soldierly qualities. Topic. Brandy Station Returning to the cavalry for the Gettysburg Campaign, Stuart endured the two low points in his career, starting with the Battle of Brandy Station, the largest predominantly cavalry engagement of the war. By June 5, two of Lee's infantry corps were camped in and around Culpeper. Six miles northeast, holding the line of the Rappahannock River, Stuart bivouacked his cavalry troopers, mostly near Brandy Station, screening the Confederate Army against surprise by the enemy. Stuart requested a full field review of his troops by Gen. Lee. This grand review on June 5 included nearly 9,000 mounted troopers and four batteries of horse artillery, charging in simulated battle at Inlet Station, about two miles three kilometers southwest of Brandy Station. Lee was not able to attend the review, however, so it was repeated in his presence on June 8, although the repeated performance was limited to a simple parade without battle simulations. Despite the lower level of activity, some of the cavalrymen and the newspaper reporters at the scene complained that all Stuart was doing was feeding his ego and exhausting the horses. Lee ordered Stuart to cross the Rappahannock the next day and raid Union forward positions, screening the Confederate Army from observation or interference as it moved north. Anticipating this imminent offensive action, Stuart ordered his tired troopers back into bivouac around Brandy Station, Army of the Potomac Commander Maj. Gen. Joseph Hooker interpreted Stuart's presence around Culpeper to be indicative of preparations for a raid on his army's supply lines. In reaction, he ordered his cavalry commander, Maj. General Alfred Pleasanton, to take a combined arms force of 8,000 cavalrymen and 3,000 infantry on a spoiling raid to disperse and destroy the 9,500 Confederates. Pleasanton's force crossed the Rappahannock in two columns on June 9, 1863, the first crossing at Beverly's Ford Brig. Gen. John Buford's division catching Stuart by surprise, waking him and his staff to the sound of gunfire. The second crossing, at Kelly's Ford, surprised Stuart again, and the Confederates found themselves assaulted from front and rear in a spirited melee of mounted combat. A series of confusing charges and counter-charges swept back and forth across Fleetwood Hill, which had been Stuart's headquarters the previous night. After ten hours of fighting, Pleasanton ordered his men to withdraw across the Rappahannock. Although Stuart claimed a victory because the Confederates held the field, Brandy Station is considered a tactical draw, and both sides came up short. Pleasanton was not able to disable Stuart's force at the start of an important campaign and he withdrew before finding the location of Lee's infantry nearby. However, the fact that the Southern cavalry had not detected the movement of two large columns of Union cavalry, and that they fell victim to a surprise attack, was an embarrassment that prompted serious criticism from fellow generals and the Southern press. The fight also revealed the increased competency of the Union cavalry, and foreshadowed the decline of the formerly invincible Southern mounted arm. Topic Stewart's ride in the Gettysburg Campaign Following a series of small cavalry battles in June as Lee's army began marching north through the Shenandoah Valley, Stewart may have had in mind the glory of circumnavigating the enemy army once again, desiring to erase the stain on his reputation of the surprise at Brandy Station. General Lee gave orders to Stuart on June 22 on how he was to participate in the march north, and the exact nature of those orders has been argued by the participants and historians ever since, but the essence was that he was instructed to guard the mountain passes with part of his force while the Army of Northern Virginia was still south of the Potomac and that he was to cross the river with the remainder of the army and screen the right flank of Ewell's II Corps. Instead of taking a direct route north near the Blue Ridge Mountains, however, Stuart chose to reach Ewell's flank by taking his three best brigades those of Brig. General Wade Hampton, Brig. General Fitzhugh Lee, and Col. John R. Chambliss, the latter replacing the wounded Brig. Gen. W.H.F. Rooney Lee between the Union Army and Washington, moving north through Rockville to Westminster and on into Pennsylvania, hoping to capture supplies along the way and cause havoc near the enemy capital. 
Stewart and his three brigades departed Salem Depot at 1 a.m. on June 25. Unfortunately for Stewart's plan, the Union Army's movement was underway and his proposed route was blocked by columns of Federal infantry, forcing him to veer farther to the east than either he or General Lee had anticipated. This prevented Stewart from linking up with Ewell as ordered and deprived Lee of the use of his prime cavalry force, the eyes and ears of the army. While advancing into unfamiliar enemy territory, Stewart's command crossed the Potomac River at 3 a.m. on June 28. At Rockville, they captured a wagon train of 140 brand new, fully loaded wagons and mule teams. This wagon train would prove to be a logistical hindrance to Stewart's advance, but he interpreted Lee's orders as placing importance on gathering supplies. The proximity of the Confederate raiders provoked some consternation in the National Capital and two Union cavalry brigades and an artillery battery were sent to pursue the Confederates. Stuart supposedly said that were it not for his fatigued horses he would have marched down the 7th Street Road and took Abe and Cabinet prisoners. In Westminster on June 29, his men clashed briefly with and overwhelmed two companies of Union cavalry, chasing them a long distance on the Baltimore Road, which Stuart claimed caused a great panic in the city of Baltimore. The head of Stuart's column encountered Brig. General Judson Kilpatrick's cavalry as it passed through Hanover and scattered it on June 30. The Battle of Hanover ended after Kilpatrick's men regrouped and drove the Confederates out of town. Stuart's brigades had been better positioned to guard their captured wagon train than to take advantage of the encounter with Kilpatrick. After a 20 mile trek in the dark, his exhausted men reached Dover on the morning of July 1. As the Battle of Gettysburg was commencing without them, Stuart headed next for Carlisle, hoping to find Ewell. He lobbed a few shells into town during the early evening of July 1 and burned the Carlisle barracks before withdrawing to the south towards Gettysburg. He and the bulk of his command reached Lee at Gettysburg the afternoon of July 2. He ordered Wade Hampton to cover the left rear of the Confederate battle lines, and Hampton fought with Brig. General George Armstrong Custer at the Battle of Hunterstown before joining Stuart at Gettysburg. <laughs> Gettysburg and its aftermath When Stuart arrived at Gettysburg on the afternoon of July 2—bringing with him the caravan of captured Union supply wagons, he received a rare rebuke from Lee. No one witnessed the private meeting between Lee and Stuart, but reports circulated at headquarters that Lee's greeting was abrupt and frosty. Colonel Edward Porter Alexander wrote, Although Lee said only, Well, General, you are here at last, his manner implied rebuke, and it was so understood by Stuart. On the final day of the battle, Stuart was ordered to get into the enemy's rear and disrupt its line of communications at the same time Pickett's charge was sent against the Union positions on Cemetery Ridge, but his attack on East Cavalry Field was repulsed by Union cavalry under Brig. Jens, David Gregg and George Custer. During the retreat from Gettysburg, Stuart devoted his full attention to supporting the Army's movement, successfully screening against aggressive Union cavalry pursuit and escorting thousands of wagons with wounded men and captured supplies over difficult roads and through inclement weather. Numerous skirmishes and minor battles occurred during the screening and delaying actions of the retreat. Stuart's men were the final units to cross the Potomac River, returning to Virginia in wretched condition completely worn out and broken down." The Gettysburg Campaign was the most controversial of Stuart's career. He became one of the scapegoats along with James Longstreet blamed for Lee's loss at Gettysburg by proponents of the postbellum lost cause movement, such as Jubal Early. This was fueled in part by opinions of less partisan writers, such as Stuart's subordinate, Thomas L. Rosser, who stated after the war that Stuart did on this campaign, undoubtedly, make the fatal blunder which lost us the Battle of Gettysburg." In General Lee's report on the campaign, he wrote, The absence of the cavalry rendered it impossible to obtain accurate information. By the route Stuart pursued, the Federal Army was interposed between his command and our main body, preventing any communication with him until his arrival at Carlisle. The march toward Gettysburg was conducted more slowly than it would have been had the movements of the Federal Army been known. One of the most forceful postbellum defenses of Stuart was by call. John S. Mosby, who had served under him during the campaign and was fiercely loyal to the late general, writing, He made me all that I was in the war. But for his friendship I would never have been heard of. 
He wrote numerous articles for popular publications and published a book-length treatise in 1908, a work that relied on his skills as a lawyer to refute categorically all of the claims laid against Stuart. Modern scholarship remains divided on Stuart's culpability. Edward G. Longacre argues that Lee deliberately gave Stuart wide discretion in his orders and had no complaints about Stuart's tardy arrival at Gettysburg because he established no date by which the cavalry was required to link up with Ewell. The three and a half brigades of cavalry left with the main army were adequate for Lee to negotiate enemy territory safely and that his choice not to use these brigades effectively cannot be blamed on Stuart. Edwin B. Coddington refers to the tragedy of Stuart in the Gettysburg Campaign and judges that when Fitzhugh Lee raised the question of whether Stuart exercised the discretion undoubtedly given to him, judiciously, the answer is no nevertheless, replying to historians who maintain that Stuart's absence permitted Lee to be surprised at Gettysburg. Coddington points out that the Union commander, Maj. Gen. George Meade, was just as surprised, and the initial advantage lay with Lee. Eric J. Wittenberg and J. David Petruzzi have concluded that there was plenty of blame to go around, and the fault should be divided between Stuart, the lack of specificity in Lee's orders, and Richard S. Ewell, who might have tried harder to link up with Stuart northeast of Gettysburg. Jeffrey D. Wirt acknowledges that Lee, his officers, and fighting by the Army of the Potomac bear the responsibility for the Confederate loss at Gettysburg, but states that Stuart failed Lee and the Army in the reckoning at Gettysburg. Lee trusted him and gave him discretion, but Stuart acted injudiciously. Although Stuart was not reprimanded or disciplined in any official way for his role in the Gettysburg Campaign, it is noteworthy that his appointment to Corps Command on September 9, 1863, did not carry with it a promotion to Lieutenant General. Edward Bonekemper wrote that since all other corps commanders in the Army of Northern Virginia carried this rank, Lee's decision to keep Stuart at Major General rank, while at the same time promoting Stuart's subordinates Wade Hampton and Fitzhugh Lee to Major Generals, could be considered an implied rebuke. Jeffrey D. Wirt wrote that there is no evidence Lee considered Stuart's performance during the Gettysburg Campaign and that it is more likely that Lee thought the responsibilities in command of a cavalry corps did not equal those of an infantry corps. Topic Fall 1863 and the 1864 Overland Campaign Lee reorganized his cavalry on September 9, creating a cavalry corps for Stuart with two divisions of three brigades each. In the Bristow Campaign, Stuart was assigned to lead a broad turning movement in an attempt to get into the enemy's rear, but General Meade skillfully withdrew his army without leaving Stuart any opportunities to take advantage of. On October 13, Stuart blundered into the rear guard of the Union Third Corps near Warrenton, resulting in the First Battle of Auburn. Ewell's corps was sent to rescue him, but Stuart hid his troopers in a wooded ravine until the unsuspecting Third Corps moved on, and the assistance was not necessary. As Meade withdrew towards Manassas Junction, brigades from the Union Second Corps fought a rearguard action against Stuart's cavalry and the infantry of Brig. General Harry Hayes's division near Auburn on October 14. Stuart's cavalry boldly bluffed Warren's infantry and escaped disaster. After the Confederate repulse at Bristow Station and an aborted advance on Centerville, Stuart's cavalry shielded the withdrawal of Lee's army from the vicinity of Manassas Junction. Judson Kilpatrick's Union cavalry pursued Stuart's cavalry along the Warrenton Turnpike, but were lured into an ambush near Chestnut Hill and routed. The Federal troopers were scattered and chased five miles eight kilometers in an affair that came to be known as the Buckland Races. The Southern press began to mute its criticism of Stuart following his successful performance during the fall campaign, the Overland Campaign, Lt. Gen. Ulysses S. Grant's offensive against Lee in the spring of 1864, began at the Battle of the Wilderness, where Stuart aggressively pushed Thomas L. Rosser's Laurel Brigade into a fight against George Custer's better-armed Michigan Brigade, resulting in significant losses. General Lee sent a message to Stuart, it is very important to save your cavalry and not wear it out. You must use your good judgment to make any attack which may offer advantages. As the armies maneuvered toward their next confrontation at Spotsylvania Courthouse, Stuart's cavalry fought delaying actions against the Union cavalry. His defense at Laurel Hill, also directing the infantry of Brig. General Joseph B. Kershaw, skillfully delayed the advance of the Federal Army for nearly five critical hours. Topic. Yellow Tavern and Death The commander of the Army of the Potomac, Maj. Gen. 
George Meade, and his cavalry commander, Maj. Gen. Philip Sheridan, quarreled about the Union cavalry's performance in the first two engagements of the Overland Campaign. Sheridan heatedly asserted that he wanted to "...concentrate all of cavalry, move out in force against Stuart's command, and whip it." Meade reported the comments to Grant, who replied, "...did Sheridan say that? Well, he generally knows what he is talking about. Let him start right out and do it." Sheridan immediately organized a raid against Confederate supply and railroad lines close to Richmond, which he knew would bring Stuart to battle. Sheridan moved aggressively to the southeast, crossing the North Anna River and seizing Beaver Dam Station on the Virginia Central Railroad, where his men captured a train, liberating 3,000 Union prisoners and destroying more than one million rations and medical supplies destined for Lee's army. Stuart dispatched a force of about 3,000 cavalrymen to intercept Sheridan's cavalry, which was more than three times their numbers. As he rode in pursuit, accompanied by his aide, Maj. Andrew R. Venable, they were able to stop briefly along the way to be greeted by Stuart's wife, Flora, and his children, Jimmy and Virginia. Venable wrote of Stuart, He told me he never expected to live through the war, and that if we were conquered, that he did not want to live. The Battle of Yellow Tavern occurred May 11, at an abandoned inn located 6 miles kilometers north of Richmond. The Confederate troopers tenaciously resisted from the low ridgeline bordering the road to Richmond, fighting for over three hours. After receiving a scouting report from Texas Jack Omohundro, Stuart led a countercharge and pushed the advancing Union troopers back from the hilltop as Stuart, on horseback, shouted encouragement while firing his revolver at the Union troopers. As the 5th Michigan Cavalry streamed in retreat past Stuart, a dismounted Union private, 44-year-old John A. Huff, turned and shot Stuart with his .44 caliber revolver from a distance of 10 to 30 yards. Huff's bullet struck Stuart in the left side. It then sliced through his stomach and exited his back, one inch to the right of his spine. Stuart suffered great pain as an ambulance took him to Richmond to await his wife's arrival at the home of Dr. Charles Brewer, his brother-in-law. As he was being driven from the field in an ambulance wagon, Stuart noticed disorganized ranks of retreating men and called out to them his last words on the battlefield, Go back, go back, and do your duty, as I have done mine, and our country will be safe. Go back, go back. I had rather die than be whipped. Stuart ordered his sword and spurs be given to his son. As his aide Major McClellan left his side, Confederate President Jefferson Davis came in, took General Stuart's hand, and asked, General, how do you feel? Stuart answered, Easy, but willing to die, if God and my country think I have fulfilled my destiny and done my duty. His last whispered words were, I am resigned, God's will be done. He died at 7.38 p.m. on May 12, the following day, before Flora Stewart reached his side. He was 31 years old. Stuart was buried in Richmond's Hollywood Cemetery. Upon learning of Stuart's death, General Lee is reported to have said that he could hardly keep from weeping at the mere mention of Stuart's name and that Stuart had never given him a bad piece of information. Flora wore the black of mourning for the remainder of her life, and never remarried. She lived in Saltville, Virginia, for 15 years after the war, where she opened and taught at a school in a log cabin. She worked from 1880 to 1898 as principal of the Virginia Female Institute in Staunton, Virginia, a position for which Robert E. Lee had recommended her before his death ten years earlier. In 1907, the institute was renamed Stuart Hall School in her honor. Upon the death of her daughter Virginia, from complications in childbirth in 1898, Flora resigned from the institute and moved to Norfolk, Virginia, where she helped Virginia's widower, Robert Page Waller, in raising her grandchildren. She died in Norfolk on May 10, 1923, after striking her head in a fall on a city sidewalk. She is buried alongside her husband and their daughter, Little Flora, in Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond. <laughs> Legacy and memorials Like his intimate friend, Stonewall Jackson, General J.E.B. Stuart was a legendary figure and is considered one of the greatest cavalry commanders in American history. His friend from his Federal Army days, Union Maj. General John Sedgwick, said that Stuart was the greatest cavalry officer ever fold in America. Jackson and Stuart, both of whom were killed in battle, had colorful public images, although the latter seems to have been more deliberately crafted. Jeffrey D. Wirt wrote about Stuart. 
Stuart had been the Confederacy's knight errant, the bold and dashing cavalier, attired in a resplendent uniform, plumed hat, and cape. Amid a slaughterhouse, he had embodied chivalry, clinging to the pageantry of a long gone warrior. He crafted the image carefully, and the image befitted him. He saw himself as the southern people envisaged him. They needed a knight, he needed to be that knight. A statue of Stuart by sculptor Frederick Moynihan was dedicated on Richmond's Monument Avenue at Stuart Circle in 1907. Like General Stonewall Jackson, his equestrian statue faces north, indicating that he died in the war. In 1884 the town of Taylorsville, Virginia, was renamed Stuart. The British Army named two models of American-made World War II tanks, the M3 and M5, the Stuart tank in General Stuart's honor. A high school on Munson's Hill in Falls Church, Virginia, opened in 1959, and a middle school in Jacksonville, Florida are named for him. In early 2017, Fairfax County Public Schools established an ad hoc working committee to assist the Fairfax County School Board in determining whether to rename the Stewart High School in Virginia, in response to suggestions from students and local community members that FCPS should not continue to honor a Confederate general who fought in support of a cause dedicated to maintaining the institution of slavery in Virginia and other states. The creation of the committee followed the circulation of a petition started by actress Julianne Moore and Bruce Cohen in 2016, which garnered over 35,000 signatures in support of changing the school's name to one honoring the late United States Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. In July 27, the Fairfax County School Board approved a measure to change the school name no later than the start of the 2019 school year. The measure asks that, Stewart High School be considered as a possibility for the new name. On October 27, 2017, the Fairfax County School Board voted to change the name of J.E.B. Stewart High School to Justice High School. Board member Sandy Evans from the Mason District said that the name will honor Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall, Barbara Rose Johns, Louis Gonzaga Mendez Jr. and all those who have fought for justice and equality. Johns was a civil rights leader. Mendez was a U.S. Army officer who joined the Virginia Education Department and lived for many years in Falls Church. On June 18, 2018, the School Board for Richmond Public Schools in Richmond, Virginia voted 6 to 1 to rename J.E.B. Stewart Elementary School to Barack Obama Elementary School. On June 12, 2018, students of the school were given the opportunity to narrow down the choices for renaming the school from 7 to 3. Northside Elementary received 190 votes, Barack Obama Elementary earned 166 votes, and Wishtree Elementary received 127 votes. From there, the administration of Richmond Public Schools recommended to the school board that it rename the school after Barack Obama. Superintendent Jason Cameras said, It's incredibly powerful that in the capital of the Confederacy, where we had a school named for an individual who fought to maintain slavery, that now we're renaming that school after the first black president. A lot of our kids, and our kids at J.E.B. Stewart, see themselves in Barack Obama. The student population of the newly named Barack Obama Elementary School is made up of more than 90% African Americans. In December 2006, a personal Confederate battle flag, sewn by Flora Stewart, was sold in a heritage auction for a world record price for any Confederate flag, for $956,000, including buyer's premium. The 34 inch by 34 inch flag was hand sewn for Stewart by Flora in 1862, and Stewart carried it into some of his most famous battles. Stewart's birthplace, Laurel Hill, located in Patrick County, Virginia, was purchased by the J.E.B. Stewart Birthplace Preservation Trust, Inc., in 1992 to preserve and interpret it. U.S. Route 58, in Virginia, is named the J.E.B. Stewart Highway. In popular culture Topic. Comics In the long-running comic book G.I. Combat, featuring The Haunted Tank, published by DC Comics from the 1960s through the late 1980s, the ghost of General Stewart guided a tank crew the tank being, at first, a Stewart, later a Sherman commanded by his namesake, Lieutenant Jeb Stewart. Topic. Films. 
Joseph Fuqua played Stewart in the films Gettysburg and Gods and Generals. Errol Flynn played Stewart in the movie Santa Fe Trail, depicting his antebellum life, confronting John Brown in Kansas and at Harper's Ferry. The movie has become infamous for its many historical inaccuracies, one of which was that Stuart, George Armstrong Custer portrayed by Ronald Reagan in the film, and Philip Sheridan were firm friends and all attended West Point together in 1854. Television Jeb Stewart was evoked by G.I. Joe Character, Cross Country, in the third episode of the miniseries. Arise Serpenter, Arise. Jeb Stewart is mentioned by the Balladeer in Season 4, Episode 10 of the TV series, The Dukes of Hazzard. Literature Stewart, along with his warhorse Skylark, is featured prominently in the novel Traveler by Richard Adams. In the alternate history novel Grey Victory 1988, author Robert Scheman depicts Stuart surviving his wound from the Battle of Yellow Tavern. After the war, in which the Confederacy emerges victorious, he faces a court of inquiry over his actions at the Battle of Gettysburg. In Harry Turtledove's 1992 alternate history novel The Guns of the South, Stuart features as one of Lee's generals as the AWB bring back AK-47 rifles from 2014 to 1864. Men under Stuart's command are the first Confederate troops to use the AK-47 in battle. Stuart is so impressed with the new rifle that he sells his personal Lamat revolver and replaces it with an AK-47. In Harry Turtledove's alternate history novel How Few Remain, Stuart is the commanding Confederate general in charge of the occupation and defense of the recently purchased Mexican provinces of Sonora and Chihuahua in 1881. This is the first volume of the Southern Victory series, where the U.S. and CSA fight each other repeatedly in the 19th and 20th centuries. Stewart's son and grandson also appear in these novels. Several short stories in Barry Hanna's collection Airships feature Stewart as a character. Stewart's route to Gettysburg is the impetus for the sci-fi-ish book An End to Bugling by Edmund G. Love. Stewart is also a character in L. M. Eliot's Annie, Between the States. J. E. B. Stewart is a character in the historical adventure novel Flashman and the Angel of the Lord by George MacDonald Fraser featuring Stewart's early career role in the U.S. Army at John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry. <laughs> <laughs> Music When I Was on Horseback a song on the folk group Arborea's album Fortress of the Sunday 2013, features lyrics that refer to Stuart's death near Richmond, Virginia. See also List of American Civil War generals Confederate. <laughs> Notes <laughs>